How's it going everybody? This is Rob Riker, your instructor and mentor. And in this video, we're gonna be taking a look at how does NAT work? Now, as we start diving into this, we need to understand first and foremost what NAT does. So that's exactly what we're gonna go ahead and do. So in our agenda, we're gonna take a look at how does NAT work? So first and foremost, NAT or network address translation works by translating internal addresses to external addresses because we all know that the RFC 1918 address space, so the 10 network, the 172.16 through 31 network, and then the 192.168 network, those networks are not routable on the public internet. So if you're using any of those address ranges internally, they need to be translated from the public or from the private space over to the public space so that they can be routed on the internet. Now there's multiple types of NAT that are out there. So we're gonna cover each one in a little bit of detail and then take a look at a couple of examples as to how they each work. The first one we have is NAT, or one-to-one -one address translation. This is literally translating one address into another and that's it. There is no translating multiple addresses on the back end to a single address on the, out, uh, on the outside. This is a one-to-one -one translation. So typically speaking, this is gonna be for a, a dedicated to a server to a public IP. So when a particular server, a service needs to be accessed from the outside, it'll be able to be done. This is typically done from the outside to a DMZ so that you can segment the network to where the server itself is sitting in a secured, a secured area of the network, but it's still reachable from the outside. The next variation we have is PAT or port address translation, which is one to many address translation. The idea with this is and a home network, like here I'm at home or in your, if you're a small uh, SMB, small to medium sized business with a single internet connection, maybe you only have one public IP and you have multiple internal users. The multiple inter internal users need to be able to access the internet. And the way that they do that is they translate like the 10.1.1.0 slash 24 network into the 12.1.100.0 slash 29 or slash 30 network. It could be a, even a larger address range. There are some uh, providers that will, get, will, that will give you a public IP address in the range of maybe a slash 24 or slash 20 or even a slash 18 I've seen in a couple of examples. The whole point is the public IP address that you've been given is translating multiple internal addresses to a single IP and everybody looks like they're coming from that single public IP going outbound to the internet. Another variation of this would be NAT and PAT with a range of addresses. Usually this is done when you have a larger address block, like an organization might pick up a slash 24 or 255.255.255.0 as a subnet mask. What will end up happening is a certain portion of the address block is dedicated for doing dynamic NAT for internal users to be able to reach the internet. Another range might be, with inside of that slash 24, might be used for Static NAT for a service that might be needed to be reached from the outside to a server sitting inside of the DMZ like we talked about with NAT or one-to-one -one address translation. The benefit to it is we have a large address range so we can carve it up to meet the needs of the network. And the last one we have is policy NAT. Policy NAT is typically used when you have overlapping addresses or you need to do something specific with a specific uh, need. I won't get into a whole lot of that because of the fact that it's not very common, but it is still out there. Now, NAT typically is deployed on the internet edge, but it does not necessarily have to be at the internet edge. It can be deployed pretty much anywhere. Typically speaking, this is done anywhere you need to translate traffic where you have overlapping addresses or you need to do translation somewhere on the network. It doesn't have to be at the internet edge. It could be anywhere in the network where you have overlapping addresses or tra address translation is necessary in the network. So what we're gonna go ahead and do, is we're gonna take a look at a couple examples as to exactly how this all works in a uh, couple different scenarios. So in this particular setup, we have um, a basic network. We have PC1 that connects to switch one, that connects to R1, that connects to the internet. We have a 10.1.1.0 slash 24 network on the inside. And we have a public internet connection of 12.1.100.0 slash 24 on the outside. Well, the very first thing that has to happen is you need to specify what interfaces are gonna be doing what. In this case here, gig zero slash one is gonna be the inside interface and gig zero slash zero will be the outside interface. Now, since we're doing NAT with PAT or with the overload, we are trying to translate a number of 
internal users over to a single interface. So whatever the IP address is that is applied to gig zero slash zero, that IP address is gonna be the IP that all the traffic from R1 is going to appear to be coming from. So you need, first and foremost, I prefer to use an extended access list because there might be a situation down the road where you might need to do some advanced configuration. Like we did a previous video that was on VPNs and NAT, where you might need to exclude a particular set of addresses from being NATed that need to go over the VPN. That's one specific example. But here we have an access list that calls the 10.1.1.0/24 network to any destination, and we use that specific access list to call from the NAT statement and to point the traffic out gig 0 slash 0 in an overload configuration. And then if we were to go to PC1 and ping Google DNS 8.8.8.8, we see the traffic is translated from uh, 10.1.1.11 in the first, second, third, and fourth entries right here over to 12.1.100.0 or .100 going outbound. So all the traffic that came from PC1 will look like it's coming from 12.1.100.100 from the internet's perspective. When it gets back, when traffic is returned to R1 from the internet, it'll be translated from 12.1.100.100 back to 10.1.1.11. Another variation of this is going to be NAT with the subnet range. So now we have two different PCs. We have PC1 and PC2, both connect to switch one. And we have the same situation. We have the inside and outside interfaces defined. But now, instead of using um, a range of addresses, or I'm sorry, instead of using just a single outside address, we now we have a group of addresses that we're going to be natting to. So we still have to have that, that access list that defines the internal address space, which is the 10.1.1.0/24 network. But also we create a NAT pool, which is defined, which will define the public addresses that we want to NAT to. So in this case here, we're natting to 12.1.100.60 and .61. And we, in the NAT uh, configuration, we say we're going to call the NAT ACL, and we're going to say that when traffic matches on that, we're going to NAT those IPs from 10.1.1.x to either 12.1.100.60 or .61 on a first-come, first-served basis, meaning whenever there's a ping that's sent outbound, in this case here, PC1 pinged first, so he got dot .60, PC2.12 pinged second, so he got dot .61, and you can see those outputs right there. Now, another variation of this is gonna be a static NAT workflow. So in this case here, again, we have to apply the NAT configuration to the interfaces as we have continuously done, but instead of doing a bunch of other configuration, we simply apply a NAT statement globally. We say that maybe there's a server on the inside that we have to allow access to. And this server has been given the IP address of 10.1.1.100, and we give it a unused open public IP, 12.1.100.100. So then we go ahead and we go ahead and we see in the NAT translations table, we see what they call the parent object. The parent object is in there, it's always going, it's always there. So what ends up happening is whenever we ping outbound, or I'm sorry, this is an out, this is a connection from the internet to the server. So we're pretending to be a device on the outside trying to reach the server on the inside. Now the server in this case here is not shown, but it's more or less just for demonstration purposes. So we ping 12.1.100.100 and 10.1.1.100 replies and everything is good to go. So that's basically how this comes into play. And so we can see in the output that we have child entries. So these child entries will stay in the NAT translations table for as long as the application is working. And then once the application stops, the translations table will automatically remove those entries until it's deemed time to need them again. So let's go ahead and recap what we covered. We took a look at how does NAT work in this video. Thanks to you so much, everybody, for hanging out with me in this video. And until next time, guys, take it easy. Jacob Hess here. Thank you guys for viewing the video. I hope you really enjoyed it. 
And I'd also like to remind you that if you're truly serious about your career in information technology, be sure to check out our Career Blueprint and Engineer Training Program at www.zerotoengineer.com.